This is episode 9 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash Johnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute and tell a friend. If you've already done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting explicit language. Chapter 19. Cities. Summer, 2016. Did you ever see that movie, Hunt for Red October? Eva looked over the risk board. Yeah, of course. It was on all the time when I was growing up, said Josh. Remember the scene where Alec Baldwin's character is trying to figure out how to get the Soviet crew off their submarine without them knowing the officers were defecting? He says something like, How will I get sailors to leave a nuclear submarine? Nuclear submarine. That made me think about the problem we've got if everyone stays in the city. Eva deposited 35 armies on Iceland. Oh, you mean how millions of people are concentrated in tiny spaces? Jillian eyed her seven armies currently occupying Greenland. Exactly, Eva said. Until the 1800s, most cities were demographic sinks, so they only grew because people moved in from the country. Oh, and my Icelandic army is on the march to the New World. Let's go, Greenland. She started rolling dice against Jillian. In short order, 28 of Iceland's 30 remaining armies crossed over to Greenland. Yeah, so, asked Jillian, after losing Greenland, Quebec, and Ontario to Eva, did you come up with a plan? Sort of. We need to figure out how to make people stockpile food, water, and supplies for the winter. If people who could leave the cities would get out to the country, that alleviates a lot of pressure. And what better way to get people to leave a city than a nuclear scare? Jesus, Eva. Josh had been placing armies on Venezuela, just south of Jillian's Central American stronghold. A nuclear plant isn't the same as a dam. I know that. I'm not saying we cause a meltdown. That happens too fast, causes ecological damage, and creates panic instead of fear. Big difference. Panic is clogged highways with unprepared people fleeing. Fear gives people time to get their shit together. If not a meltdown, then what? Also, look out Central America. I'm on the march. Josh started rolling dice against Jillian. Nuclear contamination through improperly sealed and discarded drums. Josh looked up from a roll. Well, that's clever. Jillian took a few more armies off of Central America. That'd get the public to lose trust in nuclear plants and their municipal water supply. Two for one. Are you two free this weekend? Jillian had a lucky roll against Josh. Yeah, we're free. We? Jillian blushed. Josh looked down, trying to suppress a smile. Ah, I see. No, I mean, are are you free for a job this weekend? All weekend? Friday night was a new moon. Eva and Jillian paddled along the shore of Lake Michigan, just north of Chicago. The west wind meant only small waves on this side of the lake. They didn't have plausible deniability built into this action. They either succeeded or would be caught. Even if they failed, they wouldn't jeopardize the rest of the group. Each wore dark clothing bought at thrift stores. All the tags had been removed, and they carried nothing with them except rope and a bag, a small flashlight, wire cutters, a burner cell phone, and a GPS. The forest green canoe had been borrowed from a cabin up north and wouldn't be missed before it was put back. Even if it was, a 17-foot old town canoe was too common to be traced as they needed no boat license. Just over a mile to the south of their goal, they had put the boat in at Illinois Beach State Park. Instead of driving right up to the beach, they had taken the right turn for the nature preserve. It meant portaging the canoe a quarter mile from the parking lot to the beach, but at this time of night, they were unlikely to see anyone else. Eva carried the canoe with the paddles wedged under the seats, and Jillian slung the rest of the supplies over her back. They had paddled out to avoid the beach, but now hugged the shore as they approached Zion Nuclear Power Station. They pulled the canoe up next to the erosion barrier on the south side of the plant grounds. Eva drug the canoe out of the water. Jillian jumped the barrier and crawled over the beach sand, feeling along with her hands. She froze as her hand brushed over a braided nylon rope. Her fingers slid through the damp, cool sand followed by the rope's edges. She stood, pulling on the inch and a half thick line. Up the beach, one end of the rope sprang free. The other end continued into Lake Michigan. She pulled out her small light and flashed twice, out over the water. Seconds later came three flashes. She thought it was about 200 yards away. Moments later, Ava came over the barrier. She saw the rope snaking up the beach and followed behind. Above the beach came dunes dotted with rustling grasses. A few yards beyond was the chain-link fence, with low deciduous trees and bushes to the left. She found Jillian crouched by the fence. Eva gave Jillian the thumbs up. Jillian snapped the lowest link of the fence. A falling low whistle made their heads swivel. Josh materialized out of the shadows near the beach. He was sweating and breathing hard, but smiling, his teeth visible in the darkness like the Cheshire cat. They all had smudges on their faces to avoid shining. All set? Josh gave them the thumbs up. Jillian clipped a link five feet up. Ava and Josh flanked her to keep a lookout. Jillian started to swivel the link that she had clipped in two places. It came free from its neighbors as she twisted it. Just as the link was halfway free, 
They heard two short and one long whistles to her left, where Eva had gone. As she looked, she saw the security truck creeping along the perimeter row with its lights off. She reverse-crawled beneath the bushes, hoping the link, which paralleled its neighbors, wouldn't be noticeable. The truck seemed to move in slow motion. Its windows were open to the cool night air. I don't know what she wants to do. The first voice was deep. But it's a long weekend. The second voice, higher, younger. She said she's fine staying home, but I think she wants to go. What about the kids? They don't care as long as they have the tablet to occupy them. Ah, playing Minecraft at the lake or at home. Yep, makes no difference. Jillian could see the security guards as they drove by, sipping coffee out of thermos cups. They looked at one another while they spoke, not the fence. A minute passed and the truck moved away. Jillian checked her watch. 2.35 a.m. Andy, who had dropped them off, was local and had staked out Zion the week before. He said they drove the perimeter once an hour. The rest of the time, security was in the main plant, maybe walking, maybe snoozing. The rest of their intelligence came from the internet. The plant had been shut down in the late 90s after an operator did minor damage to the control rods. The cost of the repair would have been too high, so the plant had been shuttered. Now technicians were working to empty the spent fuel. It had sat in the cooling pool long enough that it could be transferred to dry cask storage. Much of the fuel had been transferred from old storage containers known as multi-purpose canisters, or MPCs, to the new ones in the process. They could see the changes in placement of the canisters using time-lapse features on Google Earth. The empty, old canisters were now stacked a dozen yards from the southwest corner of the property. Jillian crawled back to the fence and twisted the link the rest of the way up. Ready, she said to Josh and Eva, who had come back to the gap in the fence. Each one slipped on two layers of latex gloves and then dark work gloves. Jillian lowered herself to the ground at the gap. She felt Josh clip a carabiner to her belt and the weight of the rope tied to the beaner. His hand slid over the small of her back and gave her side a squeeze. She looked back and winked at him before shimmying through the opening, which Josh and Eva pulled open. Oh, wait, Jillian passed the flashlight back to Eva. On the other side, she ran to the canisters, stooping, the rope flowing behind her like an improbable tail. The NPCs loomed in front of her. Jillian hoped that their information was correct, and that after being used to house spent nuclear fuel rods, these things had been cleaned and didn't contain much residual radiation. The 15-foot-high steel cylinder seemed bigger than the mock-up she had practiced on. The NPCs were just close enough that she could chimney up between them, her right foot pushing against one, as her back and left foot wedged against its neighbor, working her way upwards. The seven-ton weight kept them from moving with her slight frame squeezed between them. She reached the top and slid back onto one of the canisters, grinning and breathing hard. She slipped a smaller rope, a haul line, out of its bag, snapped the carabiner off her belt, and made the small rope fast to it. She snapped the beaner through the hoisting lug on top of the MPC closest to the lake before screwing down its locking mechanism. She double-checked the connections and stepped onto the next canister's lid. Jillian played out her small rope to avoid tangles before giving a whistle. She saw Eva flash the light over the lake. A moment later, the big rope went taunt and the canister rocked, falling on its side in the sandy soil. As it hit the ground, it was already sliding forward, leaving a furrow in the sand. At the fence, it pulled through a wider opening. Josh and Ava had removed another link to the left of Jillian's and flexed the fence up between the missing links. The tobogganing canister just missed the side of the fence and slipped down the dunes. Jillian crossed her fingers. Seconds later, the hissing of the canister over the sand was replaced by a splash. Would the damn thing float? They had calculated it out but weren't sure of their estimates. After what seemed like minutes, the canister bobbed to the surface, just buoyant in the inky water. Jillian started breathing again. Once the canister hit the water, Ava had flashed her light three times. Josh had followed the canister, and he swam to the far end, freeing the carabiner from the lug. He whistled, and the rope snaked back towards shore. He could see Eva and Jillian working to pull on the hull line. Jillian attached the carabiner to the next NPC and gave a whistle. The second canister followed the first, tipping, skidding, splashing, and bobbing in the lake. As she worked to pull the line back, she saw Josh lashing the canisters together at both ends with nylon webbing. After the third canister had been tied to the first two, it started to look like a raft. As Jillian pulled on the rope after the fourth MPC had reached the water, her biceps started to ache. The fifth canister went a little sideways, catching and ripping the right edge of the hole in the fence, but it had enough momentum to reach the water. As she pulled the rope back for the seventh and final canister, her arms burned. She heard two rapid whistles and a slow one and dove down flat on the canister lid. Had it been an hour, she had lost track. Would they blow the firebomb? As they had paddled over, Josh had planted a five-gallon bucket full of gasoline with a cell phone fuse at the security fence on the opposite side of the plant. It was an invisible but safe place to have a sudden ball of fire appear and distract security. A minute later, she heard the all-clear whistle. She heaved at the line, attaching the carabiner to their last canister, freed her haul line, whistled, and shimmied down the remaining MPC as its former neighbor hissed away in the sand. 
Jillian made her way to the fence, trying to kick the ground back level and disguise the furrows at least enough to avoid notice till morning. The sand below the surface was damp and dark, but would dry and look less obvious in a few hours. Eva was working on bending the fence back down as Jillian reached her. You close this up. I'll get the firebomb. Jillian worked to twist the links back together. The first went together easily, but the fence had too much tension to get the second link back in place by hand. She tied her line to one side of the gap and looped the other through a link on the opposite side, where the caster had caught and deformed the links, and back through a link on the first side. Her improvised block and tackle pulley drew the gap closed, and it was quick work to weave the link back in place. She had just about finished moving sand over the rest of the furrows when she heard Eva pushing through the dune grass, five-gallon bucket in tow. Ready? Eva was panting. Yeah, let's get out of here. Jillian turned towards the water and whistled, but Josh was already coming. The three of them hustled over to the rubble erosion barrier. Before getting into the canoe, they all stripped their gloves, outer layers of clothing, and shoes, stuffing them in a bag in the boat as they all climbed in. They paddled to the end of the stone barrier and stopped. Eva flashed the light four times. Not far away, a boat motor rumbled. Moments later, a raft of seven multi-purpose canisters slipped past them. Josh had staggered the canisters into an echelon, but even the twin 700-horsepower motors were having trouble pulling the massive cylinders through the water. The three set out, paddling north towards the other half of Illinois' Beach State Park. Jillian couldn't help but shake her head about how perverse it was to have a nuclear plant in the middle of a park. Headline. Officials deny spent nuclear fuel containers missing. July 11, 2016. Chicago. Wired News Agency. Energy Solutions released an official statement denying the claim that seven multipurpose containers, MPCs, were unaccounted for in a recent inventory at the Zion Nuclear Power Station, 40 miles north of Chicago. Two weeks ago, an unnamed plant employee informed the Wired News Agency that empty spent fuel containers had gone missing, but as no corroborating evidence was found, a response from the plant's operators was requested. According to the statement, a review of the plant's records and a second inventory suggested that the initial number of MPCs was too high by seven. The company attributes this error to a faulty transcription from a paper inventory sheet to the computerized system when the power plant was decommissioned in 1998. Headline, Empty Nuclear Fuel Container Found in Chicago Area River, August 8, 2016, Joliet, Illinois, Wired News Agency. A container used for housing spent nuclear fuel was found in the Illinois River, just west of Joliet, a western suburb of Chicago. A volunteer crew cleaning the banks of the river this weekend discovered a 15-foot-long steel canister lodged in the southern bank of the river. Three nuclear power stations are located near the Illinois River, all within 30 miles of the found canister, Dresden, Braidwood, and LaSalle. Six active nuclear power stations are within 100 miles of Chicago four in Illinois and two in Michigan. Illinois also has one decommissioned station 40 miles north of Chicago. Investigators are attempting to confirm whether or not the found MPC originates from one of these power stations. As of this time, none of the companies directing operations at the stations has issued an official statement, but when asked for comment, spokespeople for three of the plants, Zion, Byron, and Palisades, have denied that the canister could have originated from their respective stations. Headline, Another Empty Nuclear Fuel Canister Found in an Illinois River. August 12, 2016, Seneca, Illinois, Wired News Agency. Another empty fuel canister has been found along the Illinois River. Last weekend, the first multipurpose container, MPC, was found west of Joliet. This new canister was found near Seneca, 65 miles west of Chicago. Like the first canister, this one was found half buried in the north bank of the river. At a news conference, representatives of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who were in the area investigating the first abandoned MPC, stated that they have, quote, no evidence that the MPCs contain any nuclear fuel or radioactive materials at the time when they were deposited, end quote. This statement appears to be in reference to the growing public and official worry that the Illinois River, a tributary of the Mississippi River, has been contaminated by nuclear materials. Officials continue to investigate the origin of the two canisters. Administrators from six active nuclear power stations in the area deny that the MPCs came from their facilities. Three of the six have issued written statements to that effect. End of chapter. Chapter 20, 2.1.2, Governance. We must get away from the two most insidious beliefs of modern governance, hierarchy and survival of the fittest, and instead we should champion their opposites, heterarchy and cooperative symbiosis. Our current society is explicitly ordered in hierarchical systems, local, state, and federal governments, for example, or employee, manager, and CEO. Of course, hierarchy exists in nature as well, Many mammals have alphas leading their groups. The difference comes in that humans can inherit their position while other social animals must earn their leadership. 
When dominance becomes embedded in society, a host of problems arise, the most pernicious of which is a wide gap between the haves and the have-nots. In hunter-gatherer societies, communities are not dominated by an individual. A hunting party has a leader, a shaman organizes spiritual activities, and a grandmother decides where the group will move next, for example. Usually age and achievement are the criteria for task-specific leadership roles. This is a hierarchy, a type of system in which elements are, quote, unranked or when they possess the potential for being ranked in a number of different ways, end quote. Note, Crumley, 1995, pages 2 through 3, end of note. Many natural systems rely on hierarchical organization. An oak tree, for example, has many cells that work together in order for the organism to thrive. No one cell directs the others. A school of fish is hierarchical, as is a beehive. The queen does not direct honey production, hive construction, or defense. She only lays eggs. It would be possible to organize a human community in a hierarchical way. Indeed, direct democracy not representative democracy, is an example of heterarchical organization. The entire governance structure of a community could be run through referendums and committees. Important tasks could be recognized through community-wide referendum votes. Committees to carry out the tasks or propose solutions could be formed, either voluntarily or by election if too many apply. This is just one possibility, and each community could design a different form of direct democracy governance. Over time, a variety of successful strategies would separate themselves from failures. By living in communities instead of massive cities, people's individual voices and votes would not be drowned out as they are currently in nationwide elections. On the national scale, communities can be organized heterarchically as well. Many modern countries such as Germany, Italy, and Greece began as city-states that banded together for mutual benefit. The small communities across the United States could centrally organize themselves on equal footing. But as each community is charged with being self-sufficient, trade would be minimized. The community states could decide to embark on nationwide projects such as space travel, but we suspect it is more likely that neighboring communities will field athletic teams against one another and extended families will be formed across the borders. The economist Herbert Spencer coined the phrase survival of the fittest, which was later adopted by Charles Darwin. This maxim has been seized upon by proponents of laissez-faire economies and others in order to justify their social dominance over others. They saw themselves as the fittest. We need a bit of background to slay this exploitative hydra. Darwinian evolution takes place on the individual level. That is, genes are passed from one individual to another. Thus, in individualistic species such as bacteria, snakes, and mice, this maxim largely holds true, and the best adapted individual is likely to survive and pass on its genes to the next generation. In gregarious species, however, things get more complicated. In Anne Randian selfishness notwithstanding, human beings are social animals, which are acted upon by the idea of survival of the most cooperative, as identified by Peter Kropotkin, the Russian anarchist. Note, Kropotkin, 1902, end of note. This is a precursor to today's theory of mutualism, or what most of us call symbiosis. In social species, the group that works together more successfully than its neighbors will have greater evolutionary fitness. Many types of cooperation take place between species. Almost half of terrestrial plants, for example, exchange nitrogen for sugar with fungus growing on their roots. The Maya planted corn, beans, and squash together. The corn provided a trellis for the beans to grow up. The beans fixed the nitrogen in the soil, and the squash covered the earth and choked out competing weeds. Indeed, humans have struck a bargain with domesticated plants and animals. In exchange for protecting them and creating beneficial habitats, plants and animals provide food and other benefits. Many species, though, prefer to cooperate with their own kind. Indeed, the largest known organisms are aspens that share a five-mile-long root system and the honey fungus mushroom that is spread over 2,000 acres of eastern Oregon. Herds of zebra, schools of fish, and rookeries of penguins have band together for mutual protection. Packs of wolves and other predatory species hunt better together than alone. Our closest primate relatives live in social groups. The orangutan is the solitary exception. Gregarious species have developed mechanisms to identify and punish cheaters, or individuals that benefit from the group without contributing. Developing these mechanisms, of course, is part of what makes a group successful in the first place. Humans, for example, often use moral systems policed by an invisible supernatural being to help reduce cheating. Note, see Pizarra et al., 2011, for an example of the moral policing effect of invisible supernaturals. End of note. Working together is a solid strategy, because although you are unlikely to have huge individual success, you are assured of moderate success as part of a well-functioning group. We must stop thinking of ourselves as individuals, take a step back from our egos, and look at the big picture. Those of us in this together will stand a better chance of surviving than the individualists. Selfish and self-centered governance and economic principles have gotten us into our current mess. 
in addition to dismantling the physical causes of climate change, namely industrialized production and the use of fossil fuels, we must reform the social processes that allowed these forces to run amok. As we note throughout this manifesto, technology itself is not the problem. It's the dysfunctional social relationships created by rapid technological change that cause suffering and destruction. End of chapter. End of episode 9 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com. <laughs>